Shalom, everybody. Today is Tuesday, the 9th of Elul. I just see also, by the way, it is the famous Reb Tzodek coin from Lublin, a very famous uh, Rebbe, who um, his yard site is today, he passed away in 1900. The Rebbe quotes him quite often. This Shabbos is going to be the 13th of Elul, and we are going to read the portion of Kiseitze. Now, Kiseitze is quite unique in the fact that there are only 110 verses in the portion. That's not what makes it unique. But as we know, there are 613 commandments in the Torah. 74, that's like 12% or so, are in this week's Pasha. So what makes it unique is that there is no other Pasha that has as many mitzvahs in it as Ki Seitze. And the mitzvahs range from everything almost obviously we won't be able to go through all 74 we could just spend the sheer uh, telling you what the mitzvahs are but um, <clears throat> this is as we uh, we've been talking all along the Vorim is the book in which Moshe Rabbeinu reviews a lot of the Teda and tells the next generation how to go into Israel and what to do. Now, there were two types of wars that the um, Torah starts this portion with. And that is, there is Melchemes Mitzvah. Melchemes Mitzvah is an obligatory war. And that is mainly against the Sheva Amomin, the seven nations who lived in Israel at the time, and we had special rules of war and obligations towards them. They were considered very wicked people, and uh, their influence would have been extremely damaging on the Jewish people, and therefore the laws were that we don't, uh, when we conquer them, we don't let them live. Now, as Rashi points out in the beginning of Chumash, one may ask, what right do the Jews have to go into a country which has a people living there and just kick them out? You might call them an indigenous nation. The truth is the seven nations that lived there were no more indigenous than whatever because that country was given when the world was divided, it was given to Shem. Shem is the son of Noah. He, that's where you get the name Semite from. Shem was given that as an inheritance. These Canaanites, these seven nations went and threw Shem out. They waged wars and they kicked them out. And so the Jews who descend from Shem had the obligation to go and get their country back, the country that would be holy to, to God and all the different things. And there is no difference between that and today. The, the people living in Israel or who lived there 347, by the way, there were always Jews living in Israel. Uh, the the uh, different uh, nations that lived there moved in after the Jews were thrown out, or maybe while the Jews were being thrown out, but probably not. They are very recent there, so they are not indigenous people to that land, and Israel has an obligation. So that is an obligatory war. There's then a separate, a second type of war called Melchemes Rashus. 
Melchemist Rishus means a voluntary law, a war. And that is that um, a war where the country sees that uh, it is beneficial to go into the um, into that land for its its uh, needs, and um, that war, as we discussed in Parshas Shaftim, there are certain rules of besieging, of leaving one area open, and trying to make peace. So this war, when you go to war against your enemy, says Rashi, the Torah is not talking here about the war that is, like you'd say, a mitzvah, but rather a voluntary war that they would go to. And then the Torah says that if you go out to war, Hashem will give the enemy into your hand, and you will have captives. Now here is a very interesting, unusual law whose circumstances was only under these going to war. You'll see in the captivity a beautiful woman that you will desire. And the Torah says you can take her into your house and there for 30 days she has to be uh, dressed in clothes of mourning not put on any makeup or beauty by herself in any way. And if after 30 days you still want her, then she converts to Judaism and she becomes your wife. If after 30 days you see her in her non-beautiful state, in a non-made up state, you don't want her, you have to let her go free. She is not your slave, which in the old days, a slave was your possession and you were able to sell it. That is not the her. That wouldn't be the, the situation here. You would have to leave her go. Now, the commentaries and the uh, different, uh, the Rebbe as well, and the Kabbalists discuss that this portion is read in the month of Elul. And one of the uh, things that the Rebbe writes is that since it is a time of teshuva and a person has to make a spiritual stock taking of the year that has passed and wants to come closer to God. So that's what it's talking about here. The Aisha Sifastaya, the beautiful woman, is referring to the soul. And her capture from the enemy re alludes to the release of the soul from the desires of the body, which happens at the month of Elo. And then the she will weep is that we have to return to God out of a spirit of remorse and contrition, Yerach Yomim, for an entire month, which is the month of Elok. That's what the Rebbe brings from the Arizal. And uh, other uh, places that it talks about what this war is referring to is given by the, um, the Alshech. And he says, that this is not only a physical war, but referring to a spiritual battle. Because within each and every person, there is the good inclination, the Eitzatov, and the Eitzahara, the evil inclination. And each one of those inclinations is fighting to take control 
uh, of that person. And it's so difficult for some of us to overcome our temptation of the evil inclination. Says the Gemara that Habolatar Messiah Oisoi, if a person truly wants to purify himself and improve himself, he will be assisted in heaven. And so too, Hashem says, open Ptachli, open for me a place in your heart and opening the size of an eye of a needle and I will open for you wide, wide, like a palace. And so, we, if we truly want, but it has to be a real want, to overcome the eight Sahara, we have to make the first step. And Hashem says, I will do the same. And we'll have a similar teaching from the Chafetz Chaim. But uh, the Kotzke Rebbe said that it says all you have to do is make an opening the size of a needle. But that opening has to be a real opening that goes through and through, he says. Not just a knech, not just a little thing on your finger where you, you make there a little dent. Not an indentation in your heart, but a hole through and through. And um, the, the also says, Ki you should know that the evil inclination is not there to give us thrills and adventure. The evil inclination is out there to destroy you. And so, Ki if you want to go to war against your Yetzirah, sometimes you have to um, get out, which means run to shul, go daven with the minion, go to shiurim, uh, etc. And that, and that will truly help. Now, there's a very interesting debate, halachically, by the way, as to what the story is about this captive woman. There are many halachic opinions that say the Jewish soldier is allowed to have relationships with her once and nothing to do with marriage. And then if he still decides he wants her, then she has to mourn for those 30 days and do all that ritual and then get married before he has relationships with her again. There are other opinions who don't agree with that. But the Gemara says that a soldier is in unusual circumstances and the effect that that has on a person is not a normal effect. Thank God we don't understand what it is. And therefore we say, let, the, let us permit it rather than force them to do something that is forbidden. As I said, that is the only circumstances that such a thing is allowed. And then the Torah goes on to tell us, in those days you are allowed to marry more than one wife. So if a person has two wives, one he loves and one he hates, the laws of inheritance, which we'll go back to. And the third law is a ben seder to murder, a wayward child who does everything terrible and at the end is put to death. So Rashi says that these three portions are following an order. And that is that that beautiful woman, captive woman, was not meant for you. You were meant to marry a Jewish girl from your own people, etc. But something happened, temptation came or whatever, and you strongly desire her. You think you love her, you think you need her, you think you can't live without her. Says the Torah, I'll permit you to marry her when she converts, but know that the end will be, she will be a hated wife because she's not for you. 
And the third part is that the end will be the children will be wayward as well. And that is the connection, Rashi says, between these three. So getting back to the two wives, it's a very interesting law and it applies till today, as we've discussed at the Kisait Seishi in the past. And that is the laws of inheritance are, so the way the term puts it is that the hated wife or the disliked wife has a firstborn son. And the loved wife has the next son. So you may want to favor the son of your beloved wife over the other one, says the Torah, you are not able to do that. You have to give your firstborn son, doesn't matter which wife it comes from, the fact that he's your firstborn means that he is entitled to a double portion. Now, the Bechar, the firstborn, gets a double portion in the following manner. If there are, let's say, four sons in the family, then you divide the estate into five, and the firstborn is entitled to the first two-fifths, and then the other three sons each get another fifth. That is uh, the uh, Torah law. Now, <coughs> Today, most parents who, and everyone should write the will, the Rebbe pushes it and many other poskim push that we should write a will and not, God forbid, uh, pass away into state as they call it, because it creates a lot of problems. So you should write a will, but you have to design a Jewish will. Because uh, most families, what they write in the will is that everything should be divided amongst all their ch children equally. They don't distinguish between sons and daughters, firstborns or not. So by Torah law, the daughters get financially uh, supported by the estate, but they don't get an inheritance unless there's no sons. Sometimes that could be more than the inheritance. And the sons, as I said, uh, divided amongst themselves. If the firstborn is a daughter, there is no firstborn. And a son, so then all the sons would get it equally. If the oldest son is a firstborn, then he'll get two shares. And um, how, what is a Jewish will or halachic will then? You see, an inheritance has to follow these laws. But while the parent is alive, he can give any gifts he wants. He can decide to give 20% of his um, possessions to tzedakah. He can write he wants to give 20% uh, to the Chavakadisha. And uh, halachically, he's allowed to do it. Because gifts don't fall into the same category as inheritance. So in a Jewish will, and you can ask the Beth Din how to write it up, and how to get it, there is a, a, a both a, a way that fits in with Torah law, as well as civil laws, uh, with the estate planners, etc. But in concept, what it says is, when you write a will, you are saying that your request should go in a couple of moments before you die. And then you can divide it amongst all your kids equally, because what you're doing is giving gifts rather than inheritance. And that there's no problem, do it. So I would encourage anyone who's listening to this to, uh, and to pass it on, that there is such a thing as a kosher or halachic will, uh, which in concept says that the, it's not inheritance, but rather gifts that are being given. And um, then the Torah also says about a um, wayward son. And it says, He doesn't listen to the voice of his father and the voice of his mother. 
and amongst the explanations that is given is that that's what happens when the parents speak with different voices. That is, their children get different signals. It's better for parents to discuss what they want before and to show a united front to their children. But um, also, uh, just getting back, it says in verse 16, Vohoya bayoim hanchiloi es bonov es loi, that the literal translation is on the day he bequeaths his possessions to the children, the possessions that he has. And the question is, why does it say the, that he has? Obviously, that's all he could bequeath them. And one of the answers that they give is that especially, so to say, American parents or parents in the modern society, those parents who grew up in the times of the Depression or the times of the Holocaust, and they didn't have much. They struggled as children. And they want to ensure that their children never, ever struggle like they did. So they provide their children with so much physical wealth that they should never be in need. So he says, Asa Shayyiloi means that which you have. Yes, it's wonderful that you're able to provide your children with that which you didn't have, but don't forget to provide your children with that which you did have, because many of those parents who were brought up in the Holocaust years or the Depression, they were at least given a beautiful Jewish uh, upbringing that appreciated tefillin, davening, mitzvahs, Shabbos, Yom Tov. And many of the so-called modern parents forget about the spiritual riches that they have and only provide the um, children with the physical comforts. So don't forget to also give them the... Um, the um, all that you had, as the Torah is saying. And then getting back to the Sir Moda, that's why it says, the voice of your father and the voice of your mother. And it doesn't just say one time, the voice of your father and mother to point out that when they're getting different signals, that's what leads to rebellious uh, children. And um, the, although the Gemara says that a Ben Soda Romoda has such specific laws that it could never, ever be practiced, there are, however, children who um, are rebellious. And uh, we have to ensure that our children are brought up in the proper way. The Torah then goes on to tell us that the law was, there were certain terrible, grievous sins done in Israel, which could cause uh, the Bethden to give the death sentence. It was very unusual. And uh, some of these, um, transgressions were ones that had to be publicized, that these will be the consequences. So the Torah says that to publicize it, sometimes you would have to hang them on a tree. And that is anyone who got a skila, that is stoning. But even those people who you have to hang on the tree, the Gemara says, that the, the Torah says you mustn't keep them overnight. 
That is in chapter 21, verse uh, 23. You should bury him that day because he carries um, a corpse is offensive to God. The man was created in God's image and we're not allowed to keep him overnight. So the law was, if a person had to be hung to publicize his transgression, they would hang him shortly before sunset and immediately after sunset, they would then take them down to be buried. It's interesting to note that the law of burial is actually, this is this one of the sources in the Torah. Ki cover sikperenu bayemahu, you should bury the people. It's one of the points why we don't do cremation. And it also says bayemahu on the same day. And we try and bury a person as soon as possible because the neshama that continues to exist suffers a lot when the body is not laid to rest and the soul cannot ascend uh, to the spiritual plane until the body is laid to rest. Now, the Ariza says the Rebbe uh, was a great Kabbalist and in his lifetime, there was a, another Kabbalist called Rab Moshe Kar, De, Kar uh, Devoro, known as the Ramak. He passed away two years before the Arizal. He also lived in Tzvas. And when he passed away, the Arizal eulogized him with, with this verse. And you know, just in general, very interesting thing. We say in um, our prayer, and we say it at any, every funeral, Ki ain't tzaddik ba'oretz ashayasa lo yechta. There is no righteous man in this world who doeth good and never sins. The simple translation is that Everybody is human, and therefore it is natural for a person to have some sins. But according to the Al Rebbe in Tanya and other places, we know that even a Benini is a person who never committed a sin, even though someone called an average person. So what does it mean that a tzaddik doesn't sin? I mean, that there's no tzaddik who goes above without committing a sin. According to Hasidus, there do exist people. So according to Hasidus there, and uh, this is a, a, a proper translation of the word chet, does not only mean sin, but it also means deficiency. And deficiency means either that he didn't love up to his full potential, or it's saying that he does only good and he has no deficiencies at all. So the Arizal said it as follows, that the Ramak, Rab Moshe Kardavaro, was such a man, he was a tzaddik ba'oretz, a, a righteous man in this world, that did good, veloy uh, he had no deficiencies whatsoever. If that's the case, you may wonder, then why did he die? Says that Arizal, Visolisa Oisai al In the translation of the Chumash, it means you should hang him on a tree for, for an hour too. But Visolisa, hang, even in English, that fits. That is, that you blame. I hang it on this explanation. So it means blame, that when a person is devoid of any sin and he passed away, you want to know why he passed away? Blame it on the tree. What does blame it on the tree now mean? Not him, but the tree of Adam and Eve, when they ate, from the tree of 
knowledge, God said, man is not going to be immortal anymore. God is going to be, and man is going to be mortal and every person is going to die. So say that this person died because of the tree of knowledge that decreed every person is going to, uh, to pass away. So it's not because of any negative cause at all. It's that God will that death should occur in the world so that the righteous could enjoy the spiritual elevation which occurs for the soul when it goes from life to life. The Torah also gives us the law of Hashavas Aveda, which is returning a lost article. I don't know of any other society that has such a law there's obviously a very moral and beautiful thing to return a lost article. But Teda makes it into a, a mitzvah that you have to return. And also, when you see uh, an animal that is fallen uh, because it had too much on its pack, then don't hide your face. Hokim tokim imoy. You must help the owner reloaded. And by the way, the Talmud says that if the animal is fallen because there was too much on the bag and you come and the owner of the animal says, well, it's your mitzvah, you go and reload it, then you have no obligation. Hokim tokimimoy means you only have the obligation to do it when the owner of the animal gets involved too and then you're just helping him. So the Chavetz Chaim says that is true with our fight too. We can't expect God to fight our inclina evil inclination with us, eh, for us. It is only if we put the fight in together, God will then help us. The next law says that we are not allowed to be cross dressers. Now, that is quite a big tumult going on in America. there with this whole transgender, where they are discussing if 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 one guy says I'm I I have a woman's body, but I feel like a man. Uh, if he could compete with women's uh, the, the athletics, all these things, the Tater goes so far to warn us that we're not allowed to even wear the other uh, gender's clothes so that this is considered an abomination. It crosses the laws of tznis, of modesty, between the genders. And then we have the famous law of shiluach hakan. Shiluach hakan means sending away the mother bird. When you go into a forest and you see a nest and you want the eggs, then the Torah says you can have the eggs, but you must send away the mother bird, not capture her at the same time with it. And that Hashem promises us long life for it. There's a lot to be said about Shiloh Chakan, but the Talmud says one of the 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 meanings behind it is <coughs> because there are babies or eggs, a mother feels obligated to protect them. And so she puts herself into harm's way, putting herself into danger uh, to protect her young. And therefore, we shouldn't take advantage of that and try and capture it. As I say, there are a lot of different um, messages for it. But the next law is Maka. Maka is a very interesting law. And that is that when you build a new home, in those days, homes used to have flat roofs. And people would use the flat roof as a porch. So either you would just lounge on the flat roof and have your beer, in the old days, I guess, a cigar or a cigarette, and it was also used for drying fruit. It was used as a room. 
So the Torah says you have to build a maka. Maka is like a parapet, a guard rail around that uh, roof so that if anyone goes on it, they are protected and they won't fall off the roof. And by the way, we are told that this is not only a parapet, but that is true about any dangerous thing in, in your home. A person must not have a gun in his house, which the children could get to and anything terrible can happen. The Torah law includes in this that you should have a gun safe where no one could get to it unless it's safe. Similarly, around the pool, you have to make sure that you have a fence around your pool that no one should be able to fall into it. So Rashi says this is put next to the mother bird to tell you that the reward for sending away the mother bird will be that you will be able to have a new home and build a parapet. By the way, the Kabbalists say that the word maka, which means a parapet, a guardrail, uh, stands for four Hebrew words based on that. So maka is mem, ayin, kuf, hey. And what that would stand for is the hey stands for hiuhure, the evil thoughts. The ayin is aveda, thoughts of a sin. The kuf is kosher, could be more, more harmful mem than a aveda itself. That your bad thoughts can sometimes do more damage than committing the sin. Not that that says you're allowed to commit the sin, God forbid, but it's warning you that even evil thoughts and even evil sights, as the Rambam says, especially with internet, which has such dangerous spiritual things on it. And people may go on to these disgusting sites that we're not allowed to and think, well, I'm not doing anything. I mean, I, I'm not taking any action. These terrible thoughts might be worse. I once read a non-Jewish story. And that is that there were two uh, monks, bishops, whatever you call them, uh, two, two men of the uh, other religious cloth. And they came to a, um, like a body of water. And there was a woman who had to get to the other side, but she was scared that uh, she won't be able to pass the water. So she asked them for help. So one monk picked her up and took her across the water. And they and he put her there and the other and the two started to walk. About a mile into the road, the other guy turns to him and says, Hey, how did you pick up a woman? That's forbidden. You're not allowed to touch a woman. And he said, You know what the difference between me and you is? I put her down at the other edge of the water. You're still carrying her. Which the message is that evil thoughts sometimes can do more harm than the action. Now, the Torah says, <laughs> that the fallen one will fall from it. What does it mean, the fallen one? That means he hasn't fallen yet. In some translations, they gave the one who is destined to fall. But the Torah says, the fallen one will fall. And the, the commentaries point out that, that what that means is, you may argue that since everything comes from God, so if this guy is supposed to fall, he's going to fall. So whether I have a parapet or not, something's going to happen to him. So what difference does it make? What do I have to add, put in all that expense to make sure that he doesn't fall? You know the expression, if it has his name on the bullet, he'll die no matter what happens. Tur says it's not like that. We are not allowed to put ourselves into either dangerous situations for ourselves or allow situations in our property that are dangerous. 
even though God decided, it is God who decided that this guy will fall to his death, you became God's messenger to do that, to, for that terrible thing to happen by not having a, a, a guardrail on your roof. And we mustn't choose to be God's messengers to do bad things. So we have to take all these precautions. The Torah also goes into now forbidden mixtures, which is we're not allowed to plant a vineyard and a wheat field together. We're not allowed to put an ox and a donkey together to, to, to plow your field. And the third one is you're not allowed to have shotness. Shotness is wool and linen in the same garment. We're not allowed to have those. So those are three forbidden mixtures that the Torah gives you in this portion. And shotness applies till today. And then the Torah tells us that we should have tzitzis and on our, on our clothing. Uh, the Torah goes on to tell us about uh, defaming a, a, a woman. It also goes on to tell us uh, about the laws of seducing an unmarried woman. And in those days, you would have to marry her and you could never divorce her. And uh, if a woman is raped, the Torah tells us here, don't blame the victim. It is the attacker that is blamed and he gets the consequences and not her. And... Um, the Torah also tells us about prohibited marriages where we're not allowed to marry even a father's wife. Now, what that would mean is uh, that um, our father, after we are born, married a woman and then either divorced her or that woman became a widow. The son can never marry the same woman who was married to his a father. Here you have a expression, loyove petsua daka. Petsua daka is a, a man with um, certain damaged um, uh, uh, private parts. But there's, this is the only word in the Torah, by the way, which has a different spelling. Uh, in Chabad, and Svadim, and the previous Rebbe says it goes back historically to Ezra as a Sefer. The last letter of Dako is an Aleph. Many Ashkenazic shuls, their Torahs have a He. It doesn't change the pronunciation or the meaning of the word, but every letter is perfect. It's amazing that every Torah, wherever you go, is, is the same. The Torah also discusses here Mamzerim, that they are never allowed to marry into the Jewish people. By the way, a Mamzer can never come from a single woman. That's not in Judaism. Uh, a Mamzer is only someone that comes from a married woman who was, um, and the father is someone other than her husband. Most mamzerim today, I'm sorry to say, don't come from illicit relationships or anything like that. They come, especially in America, where you have uh, so-called conservative and reformed, and they <coughs> don't do a halachic get. So if a couple are married and they get divorced civilly, and then they have a Jewish divorce, but not a halachic get, they can never be separated and they're still married. They may think they're divorced. And then the woman goes out and marries another guy and she thinks I'm doing everything okay because I am divorced from my first husband, but she's not halachically divorced. If she then has children by the second guy, those are mamzadim. And those are the most common mamzadim today, just by the way. The Torah also 
forbids any relationships that is not within the marital state. The Tur goes on to tell us that uh, we mustn't take interest from a fellow Jew. Uh, as we discussed in other times, the Tur does allow us to take interest from a non-Jew, but that's not chauvinistic or racist or anything like that. The Torah has an even playing field. The Torah only had jurisdiction over the Jews. So it says all Jews shouldn't take or receive interest. Since by Torah law, it cannot command a non-Jew not to take interest from a Jew, therefore it doesn't forbid them from charging interest either. And then in chapter 23, uh, verse 22 and onwards, it tells us a very important law. And that is, if you make a charitable pledge, you have to pay it. Don't say, well, I don't owe it. It was just words that I said. No, no. If you say it, you have to carry out what is uttered by your lips, which you have spoken. And the Torah says, if you don't plan to pay, don't make the pledge. If you refrain from making a pledge like that, you didn't do anything wrong. But once you did it, keep it. And um, here the Torah also tells us the laws of marriage and divorce. It's interesting that we learn the laws of, uh, of, of married uh, divorces in a way says for, first, in a way before marriage, but that's a whole different discussion. I just like to tell you that here the Torah in chapter 24 does say you are allowed to remarry your divorced wife on condition that she was never married in between. If you divorce a woman and she marries as someone else, then the first husband can never ever retake her. And uh, the Torah also uh, says that newlyweds are not charged taxes going to the army for the first year. And the Torah gives you the, um, if you kidnap someone and sell them, the, you get the death sentence. The Torah also tells us six, uh, two of the six remembrances. And the one is in chapter 24, verse 9. Remember what God did to Miriam on your journey out of Egypt. And that is that we're not allowed to speak Losh and Hara. And the, uh, sir, the consequences that came as a result of it, the third dog gives us a law of taking, giving a loan and taking a security for the loan. If the security you took was from a poor man, let's say it's his pajamas, you have to give it back to him every night and God will bless you for it. The Torah also tells us the law that you have to pay your salaries on time. If a person works for you and you have the money, you have to make sure to pay him on time at the end of the contract. If he's a daily worker, pay him every day, weekly, monthly, whatever he is, whatever you made up to begin with, at the end of that term, you have to make sure to pay him. The Torah also tells us here that Torah will never hold children responsible for their parents' actions and won't hold parents responsible for their children's actions. Each person is responsible for themselves. It doesn't mean we're not influenced and the Torah also gives us the laws here of giving the harvest to the poor. It is called shikha and um, leket, that is 
that if you forget a, 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 a um, single bundle of, of wheat, leave it for the poor. And now the Torah goes into the law of uh, lashes. And lashes is if you transgress a negative commandment, which is a, a action, you might be uh, obligated to get uh, lashes, which is 39, if you can take it. And the Torah goes into a law which still applies today, which is called Yibum and Chalitza. Chalitza is as follows. If a man gets married and he dies without children, so then the wife, the widow, is not free to just get married. She has to, by in the Torah law, she should marry the brother and the first child will be called after the deceased man. Uh, but that was only in times that people were very holy and it doesn't apply. Uh, we don't do it today anymore. The Torah says if the man doesn't want to marry the woman or the woman doesn't want, then they could do chalitza. Chalitza is a certain procedure with a lachik chalitza shoe that the woman comes and does this action in front of a Beth Din and says that he doesn't want to marry me. And that applies till today. A, a widow who has brother-in-laws, they have to do the chalitza before she could get married. The Torah is very careful to tell us not to have uh, false measures in our house. And that is, they used to have like those stones and you would measure the weights. They have to be all proper. And the Torah concludes Parashas Kiseitze with a very important mitzvah, Zechiras Amolek, to remember what Amolek did to us when we left Egypt. Zachor Esasha Osalacha Amolek. This is what we read on Parsha Zachor, the Shabbos before Purim, because we are told that um, Haman came from Amolek. Amolek is, is, is the epitome of evil. Amongst the things he does is he attacked without reason. It wasn't in self-defense or anything else. He just went out to attack uh, the Jews. And Hashem says, until we wipe out Amalek, he will not be complete, so to say. And um, one of the features of Amalek today is a person who cools down either yourself or another when it comes to spiritual matters. If you see there are so many people, and we've discussed this many times, you want to see the hand of God? All you have to do is keep a diary of all the things that happened to you for three weeks, especially those things that, that are puzzling to you, and you'll see the hand of Hashem uh, there. And whereas a molek cools you down and says, ah, doesn't mean anything, don't be crazy. And so, as I say, this is one of the beautiful portions uh, that has 74 mitzvahs in it. It is worthwhile to study it. I want to wish you all a good Shabbos. Thank you for joining us.